Hi everyone, this is Jake Leos of Urbel. Cut it. Um, he's over at the Claremont Graduate University. He's assistant professor of public policy in the School of Social Science Policy and Evaluation. Um, Jacob focuses his research on things that we do not just in the classroom to help student outcomes and achievement, and so he'll talk about some of that today. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. All right, nice to be here. Maybe I'll come a little closer if that's, if that's okay. Um, so thanks, I'm, I'm excited to be here. I, I've been in Southern California for about a year and a half, so I'm still sort of getting my bearings and uh, getting to know the education and education policy folks here, so I was happy to, to get the invite um, and to be able to talk to all of you. Uh, I'm, I'm at the tail end of a cold, so I think I'm okay. Uh, cold medicine is kicking in, but if, if I need to speak up or anything, uh, let me know. Uh, and I also should say, uh, feel free to ask questions throughout. Um, that's, that's, that's fine, and I'm happy to have uh, a little more of a conversation. Um, so the, the title of the paper that I'm going to talk about today is called What is a Summer Job Worth? Um, the Impact of Summer Youth Employment on Academic Outcomes. Uh-huh, okay. Um, so I, I'd like to situate this paper sort of in, in a policy context of um, persistent academic achievement gaps along uh, socioeconomic and, and racial lines, which I'm sure you all are familiar with and which have been well documented, um, especially the, the volume that, uh, Wither Opportunity, the volume that uh, Dick Murnane and, and Greg Duncan edited a few a couple years ago, I think does a very solid and compelling job of laying that out. So. Uh, we certainly have uh, gaps in, in test scores, and I think another piece of this is not only test scores, but also uh, problems around um, low school attendance and, and high dropout rates. Um, so for instance, in, in some high poverty areas, as many as a third of students are uh, chronically absent, so absent 10% uh, or more of the time. Um, and, and in some cities, less than half of students graduate, high school students graduate within four years. So that's, that's another piece of this. And at the same time, I think there's been increased or, or maybe renewed attention um, on the role of poverty uh, in, in educational outcomes and, and also the role of um, experiences outside of school and outside of the classroom. Um, in particular, I think the summer, summertime is sort of a, a, a hot topic uh, and has been gaining a lot of attention. Uh, I'm guessing a lot of you are familiar with the, the summer learning loss literature. Um, Carl Alexander and, and the sociologist at Hopkins finding that um, differences in learning or, or differences in learning over the summer um, matter for, for the achievement gap and, and sort of build up over time. Okay. <clears throat> so I just wanted to throw this, this quote up there. Uh, this is a, a quote from, from Sunny Ladd when she was president of APAM a couple of years ago. And she says, addressing the educational challenges faced by children from disadvantaged families will require a broader and bolder approach to education policy than the recent efforts to reform schools. So I just, I just kind of like this quote, and it, um, it sort of aligns with a lot of my research is looking at um, educational outcomes, but looking at programs and policies outside of school and outside of the classroom, so after school and, and summer and, and things along those lines. Um, and she also knows that there's not... Um, we, we definitely have gaps in research and knowledge about what's, what's effective in, in these spaces. Um, so that's sort of um, where, I'm, where I'm headed, and um, the paper I'm going to talk about today is specifically looking at summer youth employment, uh, and uh, more specifically, summer youth employment in New York City. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you more about it, but essentially New York City has a large um, publicly funded summer youth employment program that um, is very popular. Lots of uh, young people want summer jobs. There's high demand, um, and there's a, there's a lottery to determine who, who gets the job. So that's kind of nice from a research perspective. Um, so why am I looking at summer jobs? Um, I think there are some reasons to think that summer jobs might provide a developmental experience for young people that could have some positive spillovers in, into their um, educational experiences, and I'll, I'll get into that um, more soon. Um, there's been quite a bit of research on the relationship between um, employment during high school during the school year um, and how students do academically and as well as looking at other outcomes, but really not much focusing on summer employment. Um, and so that's, that's sort of what I'm trying to do. So is the, and is the impact of during the year employment, uh, can you say something about that? Yeah, it's uh, the slide after this. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so first I just want to sort of hash out some of the reasons or possible mechanisms why we think summer youth employment might, might matter for, for educational outcomes. Um, so 
first, sort of obviously, if you have a job that pays, um, you're better off financially, and we know that um, there's there's a link between um, income and, and educational outcomes. Um, and sort of the, the big one is probably the second one that uh, summer jobs might help boost non-cognitive skills, or what economists call non-cognitive skills, and psychologists call social emotional um, learning. So things like uh, work habits, motivation, sense of responsibility, uh, grit is, is very um, hot these days. Uh, so things along those lines. And then the third possible mechanism is, is what we might call an incapacitation effect. Um, so sort of building on some of the research from uh, Jacob and Lefkren have a paper about um, students getting into certain types of trouble when school is in session and out of session during the school year, but just sort of this idea that keeping young people occupied in positive um, activities is, is a good thing and, and um, might keep them out of trouble. Okay, so the research on employment during high school. Um, there's been quite a bit, and a lot of it focuses on the potential trade-offs between these, these developmental benefits that I just mentioned and possibly um, taking time and, and energy away from school. So when students are at work um, after school, maybe they're not uh, studying, doing their homework, and so forth. And my reading of the research is that there, there are sort of limited effects of employment um, on academic outcomes. It's sort of in general, it looks like working a little bit may have small positive effects, um, and working a lot may be bad for, for academic outcomes. Um, it's a, a lot of the research breaks down around 20 hours a week or, or more or less than 20 hours a week. Um, but of course there's, there's selection bias issues, issues here. So students who decide to work may be different from students who don't decide to work. Students who work a lot may be different from those uh, who work a little. Um, and so as I mentioned, there, there really isn't a lot of um, research specifically on employment during the summer. Um, at least not that I've been able to find. So. Um, I've come across very little of any peer-reviewed literature. Um, there are some reports, uh, a couple of reports, which are from the ni well, 90s and 2000s, um, which were done by an organization called Public Private Ventures, um, which uh, when actually went out of business a few years ago. Um, but they did experimental evaluations of a couple summer programs. So this first one is this uh, Walker and Villavelez uh, paper, and that was an evaluation of a pretty intensive summer jobs program, which included summer jobs and also an academic component. Um, and they found some short-term increases in math and reading scores, but no longer-term effects. And then the second paper um, was an evaluation of a, a, a sort of a less intensive summer jobs program, which found that uh, the program increased the likelihood of people getting jobs, but, but didn't have other, other outcomes. Other effects, and then there's this new work um, coming out of the crime lab in Chicago, which which isn't published yet, but it's also um, looking at summer jobs in Chicago and has found some short-term decreases in, in criminal activity. So that might sort of support the, the inca incapacitation um, mechanism. And again, feel free to ask questions. All right. So as I mentioned, uh, this paper is looking specifically at New York City and New York City's Summer Youth Employment Program, or SYP. Um, the program is administered not through the Department of Education, but through the Department of Youth and Community Development, or DYCP. Uh, all city residents ages 14 uh, to 24 are ed eligible to participate in the program. Uh, for this study, I'm only looking at those who were um, public school students, because I'm looking at academic outcomes and, and, and education data. Uh, but so that's that's not a requirement to participate in SYP, although it's it's a requirement to be in the sample for the study. Um, and the program involves summer job placements that are facilitated by uh, community-based organizations throughout New York City. So places like the, the Boys and Girls Club, the YMCA, Henry Street Settlement, um, which will find jobs for young people and provide some supervision and training. Um, and as I mentioned before, participation in SYP is determined by a lottery. Uh, so, yeah. What proportion of the people in the program itself are not part of your sample? So, that are not in NYC public schools? That's a good question. Um, I have those. I think it may be close to a third. And are they in private schools or? Well, some are in private schools, but you'll see it, it goes up to ages 24. So, a lot of them are. Um, 
graduated from high school or dropped out of high school or not in high school anymore are in college and, and or working. Um, so I'm only looking at those who are. So the majority that are in your sample are those that have kind of graduated from your sample. Um, I think so, but I, I don't. I can't tell you for sure. But yeah, I mean, I would. A lot of them are just too old to be in school. Okay. That's that's the primary reason. Yeah. I have a couple clarifying questions. So, like, with summer job, is it the same? Are you using the same like an internship? Because a summer job working at McDonald's is totally different than like being partnered with a CBO for like to have a direct purpose and vision for what you're going to get out of it during that time you're there. Right. So that's my first question. And the second one, the participation determined by lottery. Is that because there's too many people applying for very limited positions? Yes. So I'll take the second question first, which is, yeah, um, lots of young people in New York City want these jobs. Um, many more apply than there are slots, so they, they, they do a lottery. And they say essentially out of fairness um, to, to allocate these jobs, and I'll, I'll talk more about that. And I think I talk about jobs on the next slide, um, in a couple slides. But it's, uh, essentially, um, the jobs are all facilitated by these CBOs, but they differ. Um, so the majority of them, about half or a little more, are working in summer camps, child care centers, things along those lines. But there are also jobs um, working in government offices, some are in retail. So there's a mix. Um, in this paper, I'm not yet looking at variation based on the type of job, but hoping to do that in, in future research. Okay. So. So the way the lottery works is that youth, youth apply to SYEP, um, they can do it online or they can do it through, through a paper application. Um, and as part of the application process, they choose one of these community-based organizations. Um, so I'm going to be using data from 2007, um, and there are 51 of these community-based organizations in 2007. So when they apply, they're, they're choosing one of them, they're saying, you know, I, I'm applying through the, the YMCA of, of Harlem or, or whatnot. Um, and uh, they can choose one and only one. Um, and DYCD, the Department of Youth and Community Development, verifies that they choose one and only one by looking at, at their social security numbers. Um, and so for each CBO, the number of slots available exceeds, um, is less than the, the, the number of people who, who would like to have the job. So DYCD conducts a lottery for each of these CBOs. So you can sort of think of there being um, lots, of, lots of smaller lotteries. The same over, over enrollment for each? CBO, or is there a lot of variations? So it's there, I mean, there is over enrollment for every CBO, but it it, it <coughs> varies. It definitely varies. Yeah. Do the students or know like what jobs these CBOs are connected to, and that's how they make their decision, or is it just this is my local YMCA, so I'm going to go with that? Right. That's that's a good question. Um, anecdotally, I, I mean, I, I think it I think it varies, um, and and this is, again, there's there's a lot of additional research questions to go with. And so we, I would love to do a paper at some point looking at who applies where and whether they, because some are easier to get into than others, and whether they, whether they know that and whether they apply to the one in their location um, or one that they think may be easier to, to get into. I actually sort of anecdotally was, was talking with some high school students who were in New York who were in a different um, summer program, and they said, yeah, if you want to get in, you need to apply to outside of your own community. Um, so there's, there's there's a lot of unanswered questions there that would be interesting. Um, but, yeah, but the, overall there, there is a lottery and, and well, it sort of creates this nice um, natural experiment. Okay. So I wanted to mention the, the stated goals of SYP. So I, I'm going to be looking at academic outcomes, primarily um, school attendance and a little bit on, on test taking as well. Um, SYP is specifically, these are the, the goals um, stated in their literature on their website. Uh, to introduce and prepare youth for the world of work, um, to reduce youth unemployment during the summer months, and provide supplemental income to families. So these are these are not explicitly focused on um, academic outcomes, but the the, we, the program may have some effects for kind of the reasons that I was talking about earlier. All right. So a little bit more about the, the SYP experience. So there, it's it's a variety of jobs. As I mentioned, the the majority. Um, of these students are working in summer camps um, or daycare centers, but, but it's a mix. And I think about roughly 20% of them are working in, in private sector, in retail, and, and um, again, this is something that I want to get into more, but, but haven't, haven't yet so much. Uh, they can work up to 25 hours per week for seven weeks. 10% uh, of these hours are devoted to um, education and training, so for a few hours a week, 
Um, they attend training sessions on things like financial literacy, career awareness, um, th things along those lines, uh, which are conducted by the community-based organizations. Um, and they received a New York State minimum wage, which uh, in 2007 was $7.15, I believe. And so overall, there's a program cost of, of roughly uh, $1,400 per participant, uh, based on the numbers provided by, by the USAID. So the, the data that I'm using for this paper are specifically from the 2007 program year. And so the data that I have from the Department of Youth and Community Development, most importantly, is, is an indicator variable. Um, so I have data for everyone who applied, um, and I have an indicator which, which says either yes, the lottery selected them, or, or no, it didn't. Um, and this data was matched up with data from the New York City Department of Education, um, which includes uh, sort of your standard host of student demographics, free lunch eligibility, race, ethnicity, special ed, things along those lines, um, school attendance data, which I have both um, yearly for yearly and also broken out by the, the fall and the spring term, which I'll get to, um, and also data from the New York State's regents exams and the exams that students attempted and passed um, and, and how well they did on them. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on, on the attendance outcomes, but get to a little bit to, to the regents uh, if I have time. But essentially, New York State has uh, two different types of high school diplomas. One is called a Regents Diploma and one is a Local Diploma. Uh, the Regents Diploma is uh, a little bit more prestigious and rigorous and requires taking these Regents exams, whereas the Local Diploma uh, doesn't. Um, so sort of attempting these exams could be thought of as some sort of measure of uh, educational effort or, or engagement. You know which CBO they applied to, so which lottery they did. Mm -hmm. Um, so I end up with a sample of over 36,000 students in New York, public, New York City public schools um, who were in grades 8 through 11 uh, in the year prior to SYP, and, and they applied through 51 different community-based organizations. Any questions so far? Were there any minimum requirements for these individuals before they could apply for this minimum program? No, they just need to be residents of New York City. All right, so my research questions, I'm interested in how New York City Summer Youth Emplo Employment Program affects um, students' school attendance and test taking in the following school year, um, and also whether these impacts may vary by um, student characteristics at, at baseline prior to, prior to the lottery. Okay, so first I just wanted to provide um, some descriptive statistics. These are uh, lottery level averages. Um, on the left hand side are those who were selected um, for SYP and those who weren't. Um, and so the, the main takeaway from the table is that they, they look quite similar, um, those who selected and, and, and those not. But just to give you a little more of a sense of, of the population, um, roughly 90% uh, are eligible for free or reduced price, price lunch. Um, and about 85% are, are black or Hispanic. Okay. So, um, Based on that table, it looks it looks good. It looks like the, the, the lottery is random, but I wanted to, to test this a little bit more rigorously. So I followed this method that um, was used in a paper by Cullen, Jacob, and Levitt, um, where they, so I essentially um, used the lottery indicator to predict student characteristics um, prior to the lottery. So if, if, it, is, if it is random, um, knowing whether a student won the lottery or not shouldn't help me predict anything about them. So that's, that's more or less, um, that, that's what I see here. So we're, we're, the effect of winning SYP doesn't, doesn't tell you anything about, about the student characteristics. Um, and then to get a sense of whether there was um, differential attrition. Um, so the, these first, this column one is on all students who apply to the lottery. Um, and column three here is, is the students who applied and were in school, in, in my school data in the following year to get a sense of if there was differential uh, attrition. So I did, I did the same thing, um, and also the, the lottery indicator doesn't, doesn't predict. So again, this, this is suggesting that, that the lottery is random, which is good. Okay. I think I may have missed it. Is there, so anyone can apply, or is it only? Yeah, so and in New York City. So in New York City. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Do you 
you have a sense of how the applicants in New York City schools compare to non-applicants in the school? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're quite similar. Actually, I have a, a slide in the back end um, which shows that. But essentially, um, these students are a little bit more likely to be eligible for free and reduced price lunch. Not, not a lot more, but a little bit. Um, and also, sort of interestingly, um, here, um, these percentage Hispanic are, are, are lower than the city average. So I don't know. Um, I don't know exactly why. I don't know if that has to do with the, the communities that were targeted, or if um, you do have to have a social security number to um, participate. I don't. I, I'm not sure why, but that's that's the other major difference. Um, and actually, the percentage who were um, female is, is is higher than than the city average. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so I estimate the impact of SYP on a couple different outcomes, but primarily I'm, I'm interested in attendance, and this is um, school year attendance for the most part is what I'm going to look at. Um, so this is a, pr a pretty simple model. Um, YIT is the, the outcome of interest versus student I and time T. Um, I look at attendance as well as some of the region's uh, outcomes. Uh, I have this SYP lottery indicator variable. Um, so the, the coefficient of interest is, is beta 1. Um, which will get the impact of SYP. I also include um, a bunch of student characteristics, although those aren't really necessary given the lottery, but um, I just include them for precision. Um, and then I have uh, lottery and school fixed effects. Um, and the lottery fixed effects are, are especially important to account for some of the differences between the lotteries. Yeah. So why use the intent to treat um, approach if the lottery you felt pretty good about? I've seen this used well, often when you think that there are some problems with the randomization. Um, well, so, so two things. First, I'm starting with the intent to treat, but then I am going to ultimately do an IV. Um, but I think the intent to treat is just sort of the cleanest, um, simplest um, estimate, I, I, I think. Um, but ultimately, um, about 73% of students who apply actually participate. Um, so then I'm going to do an IV later on to get a, more of a, a hold on what the, the impact of actually participating would be. So what do I find? Um, so column one is actually a, a completely simple model with, with nothing in it besides the SYP indicator. And I'm estimating the impact of SYP on, on school attendance rate, um, log school attendance rate in the following school year. So, so these can be interpreted as percentages. So I find that um, in, this, in this completely uncontrolled for model, it looks like SYP increases attendance by about 2% in the following school year. Um, but the, the model with the controls, and, and most importantly, the lottery fix effects suggest about a 1% increase in attendance, which is, um, which is, which is something, and I'm, I'm going to get into that further. Um, so then I also, that was for school year attendance. I also split it out and looked at um, attendance in, in the fall and spring terms, which, which I liked for a couple reasons. One, it um, helps me get at uh, seasonal, seasonal variation as well as patterns over time. Um, so in this case, the, the data were set up as a panel with observations for um, the terms the fall and spring before and after uh, applying to SYP. And so I have dummies for each of those things. Um, the coefficients of interest here are going to be the, the, those on uh, beta 4 and beta 5. So um, fall and spring attendance um, post SYP. Um, and I get a pretty similar similar impact. Um, so this is suggesting that uh, in the fall there's about a one one percent increase in attendance. In the spring it's it's a little bit bigger, um, but but in the same general range. Um, so then the next thing I do is look at a, look at the sample a little bit differently. So you could imagine that um, students who had very high attendance um, in the prior school year they there there may be sort of a ceiling effect. Um, so they may not have had much room for improvement. Um, so I, I cut the sample and looked just at those that had 95% uh, or, or less attendance in the prior school year um, and found a, a slightly larger effect, more in the range of, of a 2% increase. Yeah? Am I reading the coefficients correctly, and I might not be, that the post-fall and post-spring are just the comparison group of the people who applied but didn't get into the line? Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, you can see that, that attendance goes down for everyone over time. So 
another way to interpret this would be that for those who um, who got SYP, attendance goes down less, essentially. But as students are getting older, their attendance is going down. Again, I'm going back to the intended treat. So are these the people who won the lottery but may not have participated? These are, yeah, this is, yes, they've won the lottery. They won or not, yeah. this is what we're looking at. Right, right, yeah. And I, I mean, I, I stuck with that for now because it's sort of, it's, it's sort of a pure experimental estimate of, right. of the impact of, of the, but it is, it's the offer to participate. Yeah, okay. absolutely. That's the effect of it. Yeah. Did you say what the attrition was from the lottery? 75. Yeah, about 73% participate. Um, and this, again, there's, there's lots of future, future research, or, um, and, and I don't know why they, don't, why they didn't participate. Um, it's possible that some of them had to go to summer school and didn't participate for that reason. I mean, you would, you would expect the things to be even in, in both groups, but that's, that's another area where I'd like to get into um, if possible. Got better jobs? It's, it's possible. It's possible, yeah. Um, so then I, I did one other break under. I, I um, again, sticking with this, this group that attended for 95% or less in the prior school year, I broke it out by age. Um, those who are age uh, below age 16 um, at the beginning of the following school year and those above. Um, for a couple reasons. The main reason is that sort of as you get older, I think you have more um, control over whether you go to school or not. Or not. And in fact, at age 16, uh, you legally don't have to go to school anymore. Um, and uh, also, you could imagine that the, the summer job experience may be different for older versus younger students. Um, so when I do that, I, 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 I find that for, for the younger students, there, there essentially is, isn't any effect. And for the older students, the effect is, is quite a bit larger, more in, in, the, in the area of about 3%. Okay. Um, the fall off is also larger for the non-treatment yeah. group uh, <coughs> here. Holds, yeah. yeah, yeah, so the, the older students are, yeah, that's right, are, are having lower tents in the phone school year, exactly. Okay, so as we've been talking about, this is a, an in, intent to treat analysis. Um, everything I've shown fo so far has been estimating the impact of, of winning the SYP lottery as opposed to actually participating in the program. Um, and about 73% um, actually participate. For, for the other groups, it's roughly the same. It's, it's I think, 71 or 72% for, for that older group with, with low attendance. Um, so you could do sort of a simple no-show correction um, something that Howard Bloom put forth quite a while ago. Um, and doing that uh, suggests impacts of about 1.4 times larger, but I'm, I'm going to do an IV as well. Um, and one other thing I, I don't think I mentioned was just how much students participate. So for the most part, um, those who get the jobs participate quite a bit. And those who participate at all um, participate quite a bit. So if, if, you, if you do take up the job, on average, uh, they worked 150 out of 175 possible hours. Can you lose the job? Or because I'm trying to figure out the 25. You say it's a lot, but I don't know what. The what 25? 25 hours, hours that were missed on average. So. Yeah, I mean, so that's over seven weeks. Do we know what's going on? Are people you know, allowed to miss, or are they? I mean, I. I they just not got it. I mean, I think, I mean, for those who have participated 150 hours, I, think, I mean, they, they miss a few days over the summer for whatever reason, essentially. Are you able to look then if there's an effect of those who participate more versus less, like those who did the 150 versus the 100? Yeah, um, I mean, so I haven't done that yet. That's something that I want to do. But a, again, it's, so I, everything I've so, shown so far has been the sort of clean, uh, experimental, we're not worried about selection bias. Um, but, and doing that would, would bring that all in, but, but still would be, would be worthwhile. Um, so we'd have to figure out how to, how to do that. Because um, probably those, those, we would imagine those who participate a lot may be different from those who participate a little for, for some reason in, in a way that might be important for, for academic outcomes. But yeah, that's, that's, that's part of the next paper. That's definitely. a big list that you have to go Yeah, through. yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so I, I also did an IV analysis where I'm using the SYP lottery indicator as an instrument for actual participation. Um, and I do that for the, for the three groups that I've been talking about so far. So here's, for all the applicants, um, for this is again this is for the annual um, year school attendance in, in a log form. Um, so overall, the intent to treat was about a 1.3% increase in attendance. The IV is a little bit bigger at 1.7%. Uh, 
Um, for the low attenders, it was about 1.9%. The IV is bigger, 2.6%. And then for this group, the older students who had lower attendance, who, who you, could, you could think of as students who may be at greater educational uh, risk, um, it goes from about 2.75 to, to close to 4%. So I'm, I'm moving, moving fast here. Um, so then the last thing I wanted to show you was a, a little bit of um, results on the Regents exams. And so the, I'm, I'm not going to get into that too much today. Um, but so as I mentioned, there's these two types of diplomas. And it gets a little tricky because, for instance, we have uh, the English Regents and the Math Regents. Um, and you need to pass those once at some point. Um, and not everyone takes them in the same year. Um, so it gets, it gets a little tricky in, in that sense. Um, but so I, these are some results just for this group of the, the older students who with, with the lower attendance at baseline. Um, and so, I have, whoops, sorry. Um, so this, just, this suggests that there was a, those who were assigned to SRP had about a 3% increase in attempting the English Regents exam, um, a marginally significant 1.7%. Uh, percent increase in passing, um, but but no effect on test scores, um, and something s somewhat somewhat similar for math. I mean, so this is suggesting that uh, that there it's it's increasing taking, which in turn is increasing passing, but it's not increasing actual test scores or achievement, which would kind of make sense because the summer job itself doesn't teach that sort of content. So you can take the English side separately from the math side, it's not like. A yeah, yeah. So why do you think it's improving people's attempts at English and not math? Because wouldn't you want to have it improve both because it would improve their success of graduating? Yeah, I mean, so, well, do they, I mean, it's, it's it's, small. this is small and marginally significant. Um, so it, it looks like it may be a little bit in both. Um, but you, you could imagine if you think there's this sort of increased effort or engagement that may come from having a summer job versus not, um, that maybe English is something where you think, oh, I can just try that, whereas m math, you really need to uh, have learned all these formulas and everything. Where I, I, that's, that's one possible explanation. I, I, I don't know for sure. Do you have Graduation thoughts? Graduation outcomes? Uh, again, uh, not that I've done yet. I mean, so, you have them. Yeah. And I mean, so this is just looking at the one-year impact. Um, but, but high school graduation is, is to come in future research as well. Yeah. It seems to me like that would be an interesting thing here, right? So if you have the math and the English, you have to take both to graduate and pass both right. to graduate. And so you might also <coughs> see, I would expect you to see something more like the point, the one point something percent on the graduation, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, so that's certainly one of the limitations of this paper is that I'm just looking at, in, in the next year. Um, so there's certainly, there's certainly more re research to go going forward, looking at longer term impacts and then also getting into uh, the effect of, of participating in more than one summer and, and, and all of those things. So there's, there's, a, lot, there's a lot left. This, this, is, this is the first paper. This is the first paper. Okay, so the attempt is just in the next year to the attempt. Yeah. And they could have attempted it if they were, let's say, ninth grade, 10th grade. Yeah. 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 All right. Okay. Um, one more question about your yeah. outcomes. Are sure. you going to eventually have like job take up after high school or college attendance, or that's beyond the scope of the miracle. Um, I don't. So I don't. I don't have the. I don't. I certainly. I don't have job data at this point. Um, so this was. This is one of my dissertation papers. Um, future research. I'm, I'm collaborating with with Amy Schwartz at NYU at the Institute for Education and Social Policy, and they have, I believe, data on. Um, the, the city universities. And so the majority of New York City public school students who end up going to college go to these city universities. So we could look, we eventually could look at, could look at that. Yeah. Um, so just, I'm just going to summarize the findings and, and offer a few other thoughts and then uh, open it up for discussion. Uh, so I find that, that SYP increases attendance in the following school year. Um, that these increases are larger for um, students who we may consider to be at greater educational risk. Students who are older um, and had lower attendance um, in the prior school year. Um, and for, for that group, um, SYP also increases, increases uh, taking and passing some of the Regents' exams. 
Um, and I wanted to, to put these findings in a little bit of context, right? So is, is a, an increase of one or two or three percent of attendance, is that, is that meaningful, is that small? Um, and I think it's, it's not huge, but it's also, it's not trivial. So putting in the context of some other um, experimental evaluations of, of other interventions aimed specifically at improving um, school attendance, first uh, D's, uh, Tom D's 2011 paper looking at the impact of, um, in Wisconsin, of reducing families' welfare payments if their children don't go to school at, at high rates. Um, so sort of economic, financial disincentives to um, found a 4.5% increase. Um, and then this Riccio paper is, is uh, the sort of preliminary um, eva evaluation of the Opportunity NYC conditional cash transfer program in New York City, um, where they paid students um, for, for high attendance, uh, among a host of, of, other, of other things, and they have about a 3% increase. So it's, you know, th these effects are a little bit smaller, but they're, they're in, the, in the same ballpark. Um, and also, just sort of wanted to point out that these summer jobs programs aren't unique to New York City. There's, there's programs like this in, in Detroit and Washington and, and other cities as well, and that uh, budgets have been cut um, quite a bit. Some, some broader implications for policy and research that I'd sort of like to offer. Um, I think this, this suggests that poly, policy interventions outside of school and outside of the classroom can, can have some influence on, on educational um, outcomes and, and, and effort for, for this low-income urban um, student population. I, I mean, I also think that it suggests that evaluations of these programs and policies, to the extent possible, should look at a wide range of outcomes. Um, so if you were just to evaluate this, this jobs program and only look at um, employment outcomes, you, it, you might be missing, missing something. Um, and, and finally, you know, this is, it, it suggests that we can do these, these experimental research at this sort of large scale um, if you have something that lots of people want. Um, so this is, these, are, these are pretty large numbers, um, and it's a lottery that, that existed already for essentially for, for fairness reasons. Um, there's, there's lots of next steps. Um, I started just with the 2007 data. Um, in part because it took time and money to get it to get it matched, um, because uh, the, the, we're dealing with New York City Department of Education data and New York City Department of Youth and Community Development data, and they serve the same young people, but the systems don't talk to each other. Like it would, if they had a common ID number, it would have been very easy to just match them, um, but they didn't. Um, so they had to be matched on first name, last name, date of birth. And so forth, and, and I couldn't do that for um, confidentiality reasons, so I had to find an approved consultant who could, and I had to pay that person, and all of those things. Um, so that's why I started with one year of data, um, but there, we, we now have uh, six years of data. Um, so there's there's a lot a lot more to do, and then to look at some of the things that, that you all mentioned. So looking at, at long longer term out impacts, things like high school graduation, um, impacts of participating for, for more than one year. I'm starting to look at, at variation by type of CBO or type of job placement. Um, so those are all those are all um, things for, for future research. Can I ask a question on that last yeah. one? So do you have any data from the CBOs to get at the nature of the programs and what they've offered? Yeah, I mean, so there's a, so we know the name of the CBO and, and the, the job type. There's a variable called job type. And there are a lot of different values for that. Um, and so part of the challenge is, is trying to, to, to make sense of it. I mean, a lot of them are, say, are sort of education or summer camp, but then there's just some, some funny ones. I'm trying to think of them. But, you know, like there's two people worked in a hair salon or something. And then so what do you do with all of, with all of those things? But, yeah, that's, that's something we're going we're gonna to try to do. I mean, I'm thinking more even qualitative about the nature of supervision and you know, sort of those kind of quality elements that could then inform the CBOs and New York City about, you know, we're seeing better effects in these kinds of programs, and these are the things that they do in their programs. Right, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think we're, yeah, we would definitely like to do some qualitative work to, to get a sense of, of, of what these experiences are, are actually like and, and how they differ from CBO to CBO, because there are, the, the, the quantitative stuff is going to be quite limited in, in the nuance or richness that we'll, we'll have. We'll, we'll know, you know, we have a, a, some sort of description of the job in, in a word or two, but, but we don't have as, as good a sense of what is actually going on as if we did some, some observations and interviews, for sure. Or surveys. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think just to piggyback on that point, I think like finding that meaningful school op or summer opportunity is critical, specifically like now with so much movement around Promise Neighborhood and Promise Zones that are doing this wraparound service of how do you support a community and students outside of doing non-school hours. And I think specifically in LA, they're trying to do so much of leveraging businesses and how do you partner with schools. And I think this type of research is specifically critical for them because I think they often don't quite get the connection, right? Even though we all in the education world, like if you would have a better workforce, if you know they graduated from high school or if they took some of these uh, better routes. So I think that that's very important to be able to translate this work um, to the implications. But a lot of that is dependent on, okay, well, what is a meaningful job opportunity? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so this is sort of the... The strength of this paper is the lottery and the sort of nice, clean uh, impact estimate. Um, but there's a lot of richness and nuance that's that's, that's not there that could definitely um, be improved upon with other research for sure. I mean, you can look at the fixed effects, mm -hmm. right? That's a simple yeah. way to yeah. kind of differentiate between what programs appear right. to be performing better or worse right. on this dimension. Right. Yeah. So we certainly can look at whether different. CBOs are having different impacts, and 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 now bringing in more data, doing that over time, and seeing yeah. does this CBO seem to have positive impact for over time? Um, but and and ideally, then we would be able to say something about these CBOs and categorize. It. You know, it's, it's one thing to say. I guess the first question is: is there is there something there? Are some CBOs more effective than others? Second question would be: why or what is it about them? Um, yeah. So then maybe we'd go to qualitative or something like that. And then finally, just. Some Second question, or maybe not finally, I might have another one later. Okay. Um, related to just the policy, I think you want to, I mean, you, you've submitted to JPAM or working yeah. with them on this, right? So I don't know how far they would push you, but you, you noted, you know, I mean, cost effective solutions are often, you know, worth thinking about. And you could do some simple, probably back of the envelope calculations. You have the cost is $1,400. You can't do high school graduation, which I had hoped you would be able to, right? But but you can, you can match the literature on. How attendance in high school, you know, links to future high yeah, school definitely. graduation. So I think it probably helped just to give people a sense of just a quick mm -hmm. cost effectiveness. Yeah, fourteen hundred dollars for the program, and then additional pay from this, from the. I know. I think the fourteen hundred dollars includes the administrative uh, costs. Yeah, but they get paid percent. more. So it's just fourteen hundred dollars plus the cost of actually paying them to do this job. That no, no, that cost includes cost it. So fourteen hundred dollars is, is on average, yeah, yeah, is what it comes out to be. So, I mean, so we, if we're talking about yeah. one hundred fifty hours a week at seven dollars an hour, that's thousand fifty or something right, like that. Easy. So then, so then the yeah. rest is sort of the administrative part. I think. As far as, yeah. It's pretty. It's, it seems low cost. So, you know, it'd be nice just to see how that what the benefit cost ratio is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a good idea. Yeah, <laughs> It's a simple thing to do, but we often, you know, as Henry uh, or Hank Levin, you know, often said, we just stop all the time with our education research from showing the cost effectiveness. Or yeah, it's good. Are there questions, comments, suggestions? Another back to the qualitative piece, it would be interesting to get in the heads of some of the students because I'm when you put up the policy context slide, the two other studies you cited about attendance, one was they take away the welfare of families that didn't attend. And then, so to me, that's just appalling. So I'm, I'm thinking, well, I wonder what the kids would say, yes, this encouraged me to go to school, as opposed to, you know, the, the other policy options that are looking at attendance. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's the two two main areas where qualitative research would really help. One is understanding what these jobs look like, what these experiences look like, and the other, or maybe this is a survey, is figuring out what, those who didn't participate, what did they do, why not? Um, how many people are getting other jobs? I mean, I'm sure some, some people are getting other jobs, but you know, I think if you're, especially for the younger students, if, if you're 14 or 15 and you live in, in New York City, it, it's, it's hard to get a job. And then, um, the, and then the applications are something in the magnitude of three times the number of slots that they have. And I presume you don't know what the other people who did who did lost the lottery are doing. So right. It's right. a black box. Yeah. You can almost sample like your qualitative work from within that 
the fish to pack, so you can say which are the ones that are, look at the highest. Yeah. yeah, that's a good idea. And then it would be much easier to then do like small cases in there. Right, and so have what to is do it about these? Yeah. Right. yeah. The yeah. problem is, is it why it's ongoing? It's the program is ongoing. Yeah, I mean, so for instance, so this data was from 2007, <laughs> yeah. and so I'm sure many of those CBOs are still around, and, and maybe a few aren't. Um, they could have changed if they did. But I mean, you have more recent data now, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, yeah, And you said how many CBOs were there? Like 50, like Roughly, fi yeah, 51 for this. I mean, you could do a survey to those CBOs. Yeah. So what, and, and what would you ask? I would ask about the components of the program, so something about the nature of the supervision, you know. Going deeper into your categorization of what the job was, but like what were the tasks that they were doing, and, you know, I, I mean, I would have to sort of brainstorm, but I think you could get it from all of them, and then maybe go deeper in cases, but at least you would have it for all 50. Yeah, yeah. Do you think you could do that now with the 2007, I mean, no, I mean he has six, so yeah, you would, you would have to. With the newest ones. Ones. With the newest ones, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. The surveying back to ask them what they did in the last seven years ago is probably Right, right. That got simple there. Yeah. Right. And I would wonder too about just like how some of these CBOs, if, if it's like a neighborhood based like organization and I feel like a strong commitment to my neighborhood and they're always there and then they continue to follow up with me after I've been mm -hmm. in this program, I'm just wondering about, you know, some of them maybe just continue to check in on the students and they're just more visible and so that encourages me to stick, to go to school right and stay and continue on versus others which maybe it's just like, oh, I apply, go through this program, I never hear from them again. I imagine that would have different. So I would ask too on the survey, you know, how much continued engagement do you have with these students? Or yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And I mean, there may also be other services that they access, mm -hmm. education or health services mm -hmm. or something, mm -hmm. by virtue of having been in this program. Right. Yeah. Do you have, do you have those data to know how far away the CBO is from the student's school? I think we could do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That'd be interesting. That's a rough cut, even without doing a survey, mm -hmm. you could just see the ones that are. Yeah, I mean, just the, the questions about lottery behavior, I think, are, are pretty interesting. Yeah. Students, some right. students, do they know that it's hard to get into this right. one, but easier this one? Um, and also, you know, if they don't get in the first year, are they less likely or to apply the second year? And, and if they had a good experience the first year, are they more likely to apply? I mean, there's, um, there's a lot there. And do you have any evidence of that some of the participants were actually not winners? So, I mean, I've done research in New York City, and there's lots of shenanigans that go on that, like, people get themselves into programs when they weren't bothered with uh, no, I don't have any evidence. Uh, I mean, th I know that this, this program has been around for a while and didn't always have a lottery. Um, and was, I think it was implemented to try to be more transparent and fair. Um, and, you know, what I've been told is that, that the lottery is what determines whether you get in, and, and that's it. But, you know, I mean... But could you look at the... I mean, have, have you done any cross-check of, like, the people who... Participated. Are there any people who show up on that list who weren't who weren't winners? I see what you're saying. Yeah. Because we had a Gemma. Gemma. Yeah. What's her last? Zamaro. Zamaro. She presented this this lottery that they did in Portland on this uh, this bilingual program, and it seemed like it was like 20 percent of the non-winners showed up in it anyway. Oh really? Which you know makes you worried. <laughs> <laughs> like how how that happened. Right? Yeah. Especially if you're thinking like some of the kids with families who maybe they would have been more likely to do well in school and to stay in school and to their parents sort of made a phone call and said, hey, my kid really yeah, needs this. I didn't get in, but really yeah, no, I mean, I don't have anything to suggest that. And I, I mean, I feel a little better about it given that when you look at the two groups, I mean, so that, that I mean, they look the same. But um, the outcome is selected, almost, it's almost like you're selecting the likelihood of being the kind of kid who would get into the lottery. Not on your right. profile, but on the kind of yeah. parent you have. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, if you can do the cross check, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. We don't trust government apparently. <laughs> After seeing that paper, now I don't. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I couldn't believe how big the number was. Yeah, that was, it was just, well, mm -hmm. scary. Any other questions for Jacob? Thank you so much. Happy to talk much. about the paper. Anything else? Great. Great. Okay.